Question for you. When you were a child, what kind of things were you afraid of? Anyone? The boogeyman? In, in your closet? Behind shut doors or underneath your bed? Yeah. Yeah. The dark? Monsters? Thunderstorms? The disease of those days, polio? The polio, yes. Santa Claus? Jaws. Jaws, some of those movies were scary, weren't they? Well, I had all those fears growing up as a child, but I also um, had um, grew up in a church that uh, talked about the second coming of Jesus all the time. There were a multitude of books, sermons, Bible studies, all on the second coming of Jesus. And all of these things were taught in such a way that they would scare you to death, thinking that you were... You weren't going to be ready, that Jesus was going to come and you'd be left behind. I particularly felt that fear at nighttime. I, was think, I would think to myself sometimes at night that Jesus had come, the rapture had happened, and my parents were gone, and I'd wake up in the morning, they wouldn't be there, and I would be left behind to face the tribulation and the Antichrist all of my own. It literally scared the hell out of me, so to speak. <laughs> But fear, it's a, it's a thing that we all have to deal with. And that brings me to our gospel lesson this morning from Mark. Because I don't know about you, but I find the ending a curious and a strange way to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. That last verse, verse 8, is especially problematic. Listen to it again. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now I know all of us here have come this morning, this Easter Sunday morning, from different places, from different points of view, a multitude of varying needs and attitudes. Some of you drove a distance to be here with friends and family, others of you are just minutes away. Some have come because you were asked to be here, while others have come out of habit, you're always here week after week. Still others have come because of the sense of pageantry and music that is always a part of this glorious day. While others may have been awakened by the barking of a dog's neighbor's dog. And so you said, what the heck, it's Easter, I might as well go to church. But whatever reasons you're here, regardless of how you got here, I'm more concerned about the way that you will leave about how you will leave Easter. Because there's more than one door out of the church, there's more than one way to leave a cemetery and more than one path from an empty tomb. The truth of this is seen in the ways the gospel talks about the resurrection. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree that it was the women who dared to venture out to the cemetery on Easter morning. While it was still dark, they made their way through the cold streets of Jerusalem, streets that at last were quiet and still after a weekend of violence and death. These women risked much. After all, the soldiers who had crucified Jesus and who had been ordered to guard his tomb might arrest them when they got there. They might even do to them what they had done to Jesus. But in spite of the danger and the, the women not any of the men, mind you. No men were there. The women made their way to the tomb to Jesus. All the Gospels agree that the women were the only disciples left after Good Friday. Everyone else was in hiding. And though I'm sure that at least a bit, they were at least a bit afraid, the women overcome those fears to visit Jesus' final resting place. I say final resting place because these women were disciples of a dead master. Jesus was dead. There was no arguing this point. And in spite of Jesus giving hints that he might not stay dead, none of those who followed him expected him to come back to life. That's an important thing to remember. So on this dark morning, 
Before the sun had come into its full dawn splendor, the women made their way out to the tomb to perform one final act of devotion for their departed master. They came to anoint Jesus' body with sweet-smelling spices, as, were the, as was their religious custom, a custom they had been unable to perform on Good Friday. But when they get to the cemetery, to that place of death, they discover that the stone had been re removed from the tomb and that a young man was sitting there. Now here the Gospels go in different directions. Luke tells us there were two men there in dazzling apparel. Matthew says they met an angel. Mark says he was just a young man dressed in a white robe. And this young man gave the women the news, the startling and unexpected news, that Jesus of Nazareth was risen, that he was not there. So go and tell his disciples that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he said you would. Now again, the reaction of the women to this news is a matter of some debate. Matthew says that the women ran back to town with great joy and began to tell everything that they had seen and heard. The risen Christ in Matthew even meets them on their way back. Luke tells us that the women ran back and excitedly told everything to the apostles, who, however, considered the women's story an idle tale, something to not believe. That is, until Jesus appeared to others on the road to Emmaus and again to more at breakfast. But Mark tells the Easter story differently. Mark, believed to be the oldest of the Gospels, ends his Easter story abruptly and awkwardly. And this is especially so when you compare it to the other Gospels. The last words of Mark's Gospel are words about the women. The women who have just seen the empty tomb and heard the words, He is risen. Mark says of the women, and they fled, went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And then the Gospel of Mark ends. It's quite a letdown, isn't it? What a weird ending to such a spectacular story. Where did the women go? Did they ever wake up the nerve to tell what they saw? What happened on Monday? It's no wonder that by the second century, some hundred years later, some writers trying hard to be helpful added a few verses to the ending of Mark. If you have a Bible with you or a study Bible at home, you'll notice that your Bible may have 12 more verses at the end of Mark but most New Testament scholars agree that Mark originally ended there at verse 8, and they went out and fled from the tomb and said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Mark tells of no further appearances of the risen Lord, no sudden appearances behind closed and locked doors, no walks or suppers at Emmaus, no reassuring words to the women on the road back to Jerusalem, no breakfast on the beach. There is nothing but this abrupt, sudden, stunning, and fearful ending. They didn't know what to say, Mark says. Words had failed them. They felt only fear. There's a reason why there aren't any Easter hymns based on Mark's gospel. You couldn't inscribe his words over the gateway to a cemetery, nor would you carve them on a tomb. And yet, if we're honest, they do touch a chord. Because I'm betting that Mark does a better job of expressing how many feel, or at least should feel, about Easter than do the more elaborate, refined, and reassuring words of Matthew, Luke, or John. I mean, if you want resurrection explained to you, if you want Easter done in technicolor, pounded into you with sure and certain words of conviction, are evoked with poetic talk of lilies or butterflies emerging from the cocoons, cocoons, or the return of the robin in spring. Forget it. If you could even get them to speak, the three women have only a story of Easter fear and trembling to tell. They had come out to 
to the tomb as one last show of respect for poor dead Jesus. They had come out and put a few cosmetic touches on a now already decaying body. They had come to pay their last respects. There's no doubt that that is what they were doing. They never thought that he would already be alive again. You know, in a way, it would have been easier for him to stay dead. Because with a dead Jesus, you know where he is, right? You know what he's doing. A dead Jesus stays put, unlike the Jesus of the gospel, who's always running here and there and everywhere, moving to and fro, always rushing to do his work in the world, and always having his disciples follow after him as best they can. But with Jesus dead and lying out in the cemetery, well, it's a, in a way, the Romans, maybe they did, did us a favor. We disciples could never keep up with Jesus, who always had trouble figuring out what he was up to or where he was headed next. Now we know where he is. He's out there at the cemetery in a tomb sealed shut behind a big stone. So let's go out and pay our last respects one last time to our dead Messiah. You know, and that's the way we often deal with life. We'd like to get things nailed down, so to speak. Life, this life, may not be all that great at times, but we reassure ourselves that what we do is only a job. We get married, we grow old, we die, and though there are moments when we dream of something more, something beyond what we know is real, we take comfort that at least we know what to expect. At least we have a certain grasp upon what is, and that helps calm any anxiety we might have about what might be. It all ends out there in the cemetery. And though the cemetery isn't much as far as destination goes, there's so com some comfort in knowing where it all ends and how it all ends. So let's go out and pay our last respects. Now I'm not sure that the uh, women were thinking anything like this while they were walking to the tomb. But I wouldn't be surprised if these thoughts or something like them had crossed their minds or the minds of other disciples. One thing I do know, however, the women certainly expected to find him dead. They never, even after all of his teaching, expected that he would be alive. They never imagined that there would be more than death that indeed death had not won and that the tomb was not the end. Jesus was alive and their journey with him had not ended. In fact, it had just begun. In other words, they were in for the surprise of their lives. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man who said, you see, Jesus, he isn't here. He's risen. He's already in Galilee. Go and tell the disciples that he has gone on before you. But they couldn't obey the young man's directions to go and tell, at least not immediately. Because the first thing they felt was fear. They were afraid. Once again, Jesus had given them the slip. They'd come out to the cemetery to give him a decent burial, but he would not stay nailed shut. He would not just exist as some sweet memory. As always, he had gone on before them, out ahead of them and into the future, out of death and into life, and this scared them half out of their wits. And if we took the message of Easter halfway seriously, it would frighten us as well. Have we come here this morning as those women came to the tomb? Have we come to pay our respects to Jesus? Jesus who lived so long ago. Jesus who did and said some wonderful things but is no more. We may have come down here to nail our faith down and to be reassured once again about something which we think we are certain about. 
Resurrection? Sure, got it all nailed down. Safe and secure, no problem. Hallelujah and amen. Let's stand and sing the final hymn. But that's not the way the risen Christ does business. What he offers is not always certainty, but more often wonder, awe, and amazement. What he offers is not some nice little ending where all the pieces come together. He offers a new beginning, a chance to start all over again, a chance to actually do and live as he taught us to do and live. And that is scary. Because if Jesus is alive, then I might actually have to do good for those who would harm me. I'd need to pray for and love my enemies. I'd have to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked and visit those who are sick and in prison. I'd need to live as Jesus taught me to live if he is still alive. Mark never got around to putting the final touches on his gospel, and that's okay. Because the whole point of the empty tomb is that the story is open-ended. Like the women at the tomb on this Easter morning, we too see something, we hear something, but nothing has been explained. We must decide. He is going on before us. He isn't in the tomb. He's out in Galilee. He's out in Pottstown or Phoenixville. And if we came out to the place of death wanting proof, we will get no proof. What we will get is life, a living Lord who is way out ahead of us, calling us to follow in his footsteps. Those well-meaning second century writers who added 12 reassuring verses to more satisfactorily end Mark's gospel, maybe they weren't all that misguided because that's what each of us must do with Mark's story of the empty tomb. We have to finish the story for ourselves in our own lives. We have, not been, we have been told that he is not here, that he will not stay nailed down, sealed shut, all tied up and secure. He will not be held by death. So if we would follow him, we must move forward into the future, out into whatever Galilee there is to which we must go on Monday morning. That's where he is. That's where Jesus will meet us. And that good news is a little scary. No wonder the last word in Mark's gospel and then the first Easter story is fear. They were afraid. After all, what are you supposed to do with such a story? We came here looking for Jesus, but he isn't here. Some guy dressed in white told me so already. We just missed him. By this time, he's already in Galilee. He's already out there ahead of us. He's gone on before us. So now we must go and tell.